One of the questions I'm frequently asked as a pastor is this one. Is it possible for me to start over after a major mistake, or do I have to spend the rest of my life paying for that mistake? When somebody asks that, if they're a Christian, they're not asking, am I going to heaven when I die? That's not the issue. The issue is, is my life on earth going to be a living hell trying to pay for this mistake, or can I start over? Maybe you've had a similar question, a bankruptcy, a divorce, a moral failure has left you sitting on the ash heaps of a ruined life, and you wonder over and over again, can I ever recover from this? Well, I've got some bad news and some good news for you. The bad news is life has no rewind button on it. You can't erase the past. That's the bad news. The good news is your failure doesn't have to be the final chapter of your life. God says you can have a new beginning. And that's what we're going to talk about today. As we conclude our series, How Can I Know?, we're going to look at not a theological question, but a very practical question. And that is, how can I know how to start over after I've blown it? And we're going to find the answers in God's Word. God says there are four components that are essential for the new beginning He wants each of us to experience. And it all begins with admitting our mistakes. Our daughters grew up watching Sesame Street. Remember Sesame Street? And one of the signature characters was Big Bird. And Big Bird had a line he used all the time. He said, everybody makes mistakes. When one of my daughters, I'll let you guess which one, was getting ready to get spanked by me, I was about to wallop her when she stopped and she said, but dad, everybody makes mistakes. I started laughing so hard I couldn't spank. You can't laugh and spank at the same time. It just doesn't work out. But she was right, and Big Bird is right. We all make mistakes. Now, there are various shapes and sizes. There are what I call slip-ups. Those are minor mistakes that have a few consequences, a speeding ticket maybe. Then you have mess-ups. Those have more severe consequences. But then they're what I call the blow-ups. These are life-altering mistakes that you wonder if you can ever recover from. And these kind of blow-ups are accompanied by laments, if only. If only I hadn't clicked onto that website. If only I hadn't succumbed to that addiction. If only I had stopped that relationship before it was discovered. Those are the kind of mistakes we're talking about. And the beginning place for a new beginning is admitting that we have made a mistake. And that's very hard for a lot of people to do. A lot of people have a hard time admitting their mistakes. One reason is out of pride. You know, Romans 3.23 was Paul saying, all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. That word sin, harmatia, means to miss the mark. We've all missed the bullseye in God's mind. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And there's a reason for that. Romans 5.12 says, because of Adam, through one man, sin entered the world, and death spread to all because all sinned. Because of Adam's sin, it means you and I have inherited a defective operating system, if you will. We're prone to make mistakes. When God says yes, our first inclination is to say no. When God says no, our first inclination is to say yes. And because of that defective operating system, we are all inclined to make mistakes. The other reason people have a hard time making or admitting their mistakes is really the opposite reason, out of fear. They're afraid that if they admit their mistakes, they're going to open themselves up to some painful consequences. 
Adam and Eve tried to hide their sin. They ran from God after they sinned, thinking they could hide themselves from Him. We do the same thing. We think acknowledging my mistake at work will lead to my termination. Admitting an immoral relationship will end in a divorce. Acknowledging our addiction will lose, cause us to lose our reputation. But here's the problem with cover-ups. They rarely work. I mean, it's too bad our friends in Washington, D.C. haven't learned that. You know, in 50, 60 years, it's always the same thing. It's not the crime that gets them. It's the cover-up. The same is true for us. And even if we could hide our mistakes from other people, we can never hide them from God. Hebrews 4.13 says, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. However, beyond the ineffectiveness of cover-ups, there's even a more important reason to admit our failure Admitting our mistakes is a prerequisite to moving beyond our mistakes. You know, Proverbs 28, 13 talks about the benefits of admitting our mistakes. He who conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Think about it. Admitting our mistakes is essential for, first of all, admit, receiving God's forgiveness. Augustine said, God gives to those whose hands are empty. Only when we empty ourselves of our excuses, our rationalizations, our blame of other people, only then can we truly receive God's forgiveness. Secondly, admitting our mistakes is essential for renewing in our physical and emotional vitality. You know, cover-ups can be draining. Trying to hide those bills from your mate trying to remember what story you told to what person. Those all take a toll on our physical and emotional strength. Nobody understood that more than David. After his sin with Bathsheba, he spent from anywhere from six months to a year trying to cover over his adulterous relationship. He even went to the point of having Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed on the front lines of battle. But none of it worked. And he wrote about later that period in his time when he refused to admit his mistake. He said in Psalm 32, verses 3 to 4, When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For a day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Have you ever felt that way? Just the oppression of your mistake, constantly hoping, praying nobody finds out. Then came the day when Nathan the prophet walked into the court of the king, pointed his bony finger at David and said, guilty. And at that point, David knew the cover-up was over. Everybody knew and as painful as that was, there was a sense of relief when David was finally confronted with his sin, and he admitted it. In Psalm 32, verses 5 and 11, he said, I acknowledged my sin to you, God, and my iniquity I did not hide. That is, I did not hide it any longer. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Be glad in the Lord, and rejoice, you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all who are upright in heart. Thirdly, admitting our mistakes is essential to learning from our mistakes. You know, every failure we experience has a price tag attached to it. Every failure costs you something. It may cost you your job, your reputation, your financial solvency, but every failure has a price tag. And the price tag we pay for our failures is kind of like tuition we pray, pay for a course in school. Uh, you know, failure is a price tag attached to it that we pay for our mistakes in life. And the only thing worse than having to pay it once is to have to pay it again. 
You know, think about going through a course in college. You pay the money for the course, you take the course, you flunk the course, and you have to pay the tuition and experience the course all over again. In the Bible, the Bible has a term for that kind of tuition from the school of hard knocks. It's called a reproof. <clears throat> a reproof is a painful consequence of my mistake. And the writer of, he <clears throat> the writer of Proverbs says that the wise person is the one who learns from reproofs instead of ignores them. Proverbs 10, 17 says, one who is on the path of life follows instruction, but he who ignores a reproof goes astray. Proverbs 12, verse 1 says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but the one who hates reproof is stupid. Now, I was always taught you're not supposed to say stupid, but the Bible does. The Bible said somebody who doesn't learn from his mistakes, somebody who repeats them and experiences the consequences over and over again is stupid. There's no other word for it. Do you want to be stupid? I don't. Then learn from your mistakes, the Bible says. Admitting our mistake is prerequisite to learning from our mistakes. Secondly, after admitting our mistakes, our new beginning includes experiencing God's forgiveness. We must receive God's forgiveness. Now, this is key to understanding. In the Bible, there are two kinds of forgiveness, and a lot of Christians get this confused. First of all, there's God's judicial forgiveness, Judicial forgiveness happens when I trust in Jesus as my Savior. The moment you trust in Christ as your Savior, God declares you not guilty because God has paid for not just some of your sins, but all of your sins, past, present, and future, have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what happens when you become a Christian. In Romans 5.1, Paul said, <clears throat> Therefore, having been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. David wrote about the wonderful qualities of that judicial forgiveness in Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2. Listen to these words from David. How blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Well, you notice three key words that describe our judicial forgiveness. First of all, forgiven. How blessed is the person who is forgiven? That word forgiven means to separate. You know, we have a hard time separating people from their failures. If somebody's had a big, massive failure, every time we see that person or even hear their name, we think of their failure. I could go through history and give you name after name and you would name a failure, that person who committed. But the great thing about God is when God forgives us, he separates us from our failure. He doesn't think about our mess up. He separates us from our failure. That's what it means to be forgiven. A great illustration of this occurred in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. We all know that the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to make atonement, but before he did that, before he went into the Holy of Holies, he had a goat brought to him. And the high priest would take his hands and place over the head of that goat and would confess the sins of the Israelites. And then once he had finished the confession of sins, that goat was sent off into the wilderness never to be seen again. That goat was called the scapegoat. That's where we get our term, scapegoat. Somebody else who takes the blame. The scapegoat went never to be seen again. It's a picture of the way God forgives us. In Psalm 103, verse 12, the psalmist said, As far as the east is from the west... So far, God has removed our transgressions from us. Not only has he forgiven, separated us from our sin, he has covered our sin. Have you ever had a garment that had a spot on it? And you tried to put some water on it and rub it out and it goes away for about five seconds and then it comes back again. 
and you scrub and you scrub and you might try something you shouldn't try on it and you ruin the garment but you don't remove the spot. No, you have to take it to the dry cleaner and the dry cleaner has some special chemical. I don't know what it is, but it removes that spot forever. Ladies and gentlemen, you and I can never remove the stain of our sin. It keeps appearing and appearing and appearing. But there is a detergent, so to speak. It's called the blood of Christ. And the blood of Christ covers and removes the stain of our sin forever and ever. It was that kind of covering David longed for in Psalm 51, verse 7, when he said, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. God has covered your sin. And finally, the word impute. He does not impute our sin against us. That word impute means to charge to one's account. You know, if you use a debit card, or maybe you're back in the Stone Age like I am and still write checks, but it's the same thing. Every time you use a debit card or you write a check, you're lowering the resources you have in your bank account. It keeps going down and down and down and down towards zero. And the only way to change that is by making a deposit that replenishes the money that you spent. All of us have a spiritual bank account with God. And every day, we're making debits against that account. Every wrong action Every wrong attitude, every wrong thought cost us. And our balance is going down, down, down. Here's the bad news. There's nothing we can do to add to our account. Anything we think is good in our eyes is counterfeit in God's eyes. It's as worthless as counterfeit. Isaiah 64, 6 says, our righteousness, the best we can do is like a filthy rag to God. So we're always in a deficit position in our spiritual bank account. And if we die with that debt still owed, we spend eternity in hell trying to work that debt off and we'll never be able to do so. But God makes us a wonderful offer. He says when we trust in Christ as our Savior, God fills our spiritual bank account not with counterfeit, but with genuine righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus. And there's an overabounding amount of it that we can never spend away in a thousand lifetimes. Every time we sin, that is replenished by the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Paul explained it this way in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You remember that old song, gospel song we used to sing? He paid a debt he did not owe. I owned a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. That's what Christ has done for us. He has forgiven us, separated us. He has covered our sin, and he does not take our sin into account any longer. I wrote down this week three things that God's forgiveness means for you and me. God's judicial forgiveness means he will never think of your failure when he thinks of you. Secondly, it means your mistake has been permanently erased from God's record of your life. And third, your sin means God will never call up your sin for further review. No wonder David was so ecstatic. Oh, how blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. That's judicial forgiveness. But there's a second kind of forgiveness, and that is parental forgiveness, relational forgiveness. Even though we as Christians have been judicially forgiven and never have to fear hell, we still sin, don't we? And that sin erects a barrier between us and God in our daily experience. First John tells us that if we say we have no sin, we are liars. 
But 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not a verse for non-Christians. John is writing to little children, believers. He said, if we say we don't sin, we're a liar. We still sin after we become a Christian. And while we don't have to worry about hell as a result of that sin, it still makes a barrier between God and us. Isaiah 59, 2 says, your sin has become a barrier between you and God. And there is only one way to remove that barrier that our sin causes with our Heavenly Father, and that is confession. I mean, those of you who are parents, if your child rebels against you, you don't kick them out of your family. You don't disown them. They're still your child. But until they repent of that rebellion, acknowledge their mistake, there's going to be a barrier between you and your child. And so it is in our relationship with God. How do we remove that barrier? It's by confession, admitting to God our sin. Alan J. Redpath, the Bible scholar, said, it is a tremendous moment in a Christian's life when he can honestly look up into the face of God and say, yes, Lord, you're right and I'm wrong. Yes, Lord, I got what I deserved in this situation. Yes, Lord, you are right and I'm wrong. This is the thing for which God has been working in your life and in mine from the moment of our salvation. Admitting your mistakes is essential for receiving God's forgiveness. You know, you may ask the question, well, if I've been forgiven by God, why do I still experience the consequences of my sin? Listen, God's forgiveness erases, erases the eternal consequences of your sin. You never have to fear hell. But God's forgiveness does not always erase the temporary consequences of your sin. Forgiven Christians still go to prison. They still experience divorce. They still have to deal with STDs. They still have to deal with termination from jobs or bankruptcy. There are temporary consequences. But those consequences are not a sign of God's hatred of you. They actually are a sign of God's love for you. Think about King David. Even after he was forgiven, he still suffered consequences the rest of his life. Those consequences included a dead baby that he and Bathsheba experienced, a disloyal son, Absalom, who instilled a rebellion against David, and a divided kingdom. And yet, how did David view those afflictions? He said in Psalm 119, verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. He was saying, every time I'm tempted to look out that balcony window to see if there's another young woman bathing on the rooftop, I look away. I remember the pain of my sin, and that discipline keeps me walking with God. That's why God allows us to continue to experience some consequences for our sin out of his mercy, not of, out of his hatred. We admit our mistakes. We have to experience God's forgiveness, and that prepares us for a time of waiting for God's direction. In my book, Second Chance, Second Act, I talk about the concept of intermissions in life. Intermission is that period of time between your failure and your future. It's that period of time between the ending of one relationship and the beginning of a new relationship, or the ending of one job and the beginning of a new career. It's that period of time between bankruptcy and financial solvency. Now, we hate waiting time. We just want to go immediately from one relationship to the next one, one career to the next one. But God says, no, there's going to be a time out for your benefit. God uses time outs, and he uses them in the life of his people. Think of the southern kingdom of Israel. They had rebelled against God. 
Judah was taken captive by the Babylonians. They spent 70 years in an intermission, renewing their relationship with God, preparing them for their return to their land. Peter got off easier. His intermission between his failure and future was only seven weeks. It was seven weeks from the time he denied Christ in Caiaphas' courtyard till the time he stood on the southern steps and preached that great message of Pentecost. Moses had a 40-year intermission. That was the time between when he killed that Egyptian soldier thinking that would lead to the exodus. He spent 40 years in the wilderness until his second act began at age 80. Acts 7, verses 29 and 30 tell us, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. After 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him. Waiting time is difficult, but waiting time doesn't have to be wasted time. There are some benefits of our intermission. It's a time to replenish our physical and emotional energy. Going through a failure can be physically, emotionally draining. Elijah understood that, and God told him to take some time off to eat and sleep. He needed a time of physical and emotional uh, replenishing. Not only that, but secondly, intermissions are times to reflect on your failure and on your future. I've listed for you some questions that you can ask if you're in that intermission time right now. Have I really failed or just fallen short of some unrealistic goal? Is my failure the result of other people's circumstances or is it my own wrong choices? Whom do I know that has made a similar mistake and recovered from it? What can I do differently in the future to prevent a similar failure? And is there anything in my life that's displeasing to God? It's a time not only to recover from your failure, but it's a time to focus on your future. I have a friend a few years ago who called me on a Thursday afternoon. He said he had been unexpectedly terminated from his job and wondered what he should do. I said, the first thing you need to do is you and your wife need to take off for the weekend. Go someplace if you can. Regain your equilibrium. But on Monday morning, you need to get up, get up, set your alarm clock at your regular time, get dressed, and instead of going to work, you need to sit down with a legal pad and answer the following questions. And there were questions I got from my friend Bob Beal. Number one, what three things would I like to accomplish before I die? Folks, that is a focusing question every one of us ought to ask. What three things would I like to accomplish before I die? Am I in the vocation I want to be in 10 years from now? What do I feel most passionately about in life? What do other people say I'm gifted to do? By the way, Philippians 2.13 says, God gives you both your passions and your gifts. God is at work in you, giving you the desire and the power to do his will. Asking yourself what you're passionate about and what other people say you're gifted to do <clears throat> can be a key indicator. And finally, what would be an ideal day for me? Where would I be living? What job would I have? What people would be around me? By the way, you don't have to wait to a crisis to ask yourself those questions. Take some time off. Take a few hours and ask yourself those questions to try to discern God's guidance in your life. Once your intermission is over, it's time finally for starting over with your new beginning. Now, when you start over with your new beginning, hopefully you'll have a lot of questions answered. But you need what I call a second act script that details what you're going to do in this second act of your life. While you're in your intermission time is a great time to develop that second act script. You know, a lot of Christians think it's unspiritual, Pastor, 
to be planning. We ought to just leave it up to God. No, the Bible extols the virtues of planning. In Proverbs 16, 3, Solomon said, commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. Proverbs 20, 18, prepare plans by consultation. Proverbs 21, 5, the plans of the diligent surely lead to an advantage. Now, obviously, all of our plans are subject to the so sovereignty of God, but that doesn't keep us from making plans. Well, pastor, what do you mean a new beginning script? Well, here are four things your script ought to include. And again, these are from our friend Bob Beal. Number one, clarification of the problem. What problem are you trying to recover from? See, it if you, see if you can distill it down to one word. It may be bankruptcy. It may be addiction. It might be termination from a job. It might be divorce. What problem are you trying to recover from? Secondly, visualize the goal. You need a visualization of the goal. In a sentence, how would you like to recover from this problem? Maybe a career change. I would like to have a job that is fulfilling and safe. Wouldn't everybody like to have a job like that? Something that's fulfilling and safe. Maybe you've gone through financial difficulty, even a bankruptcy. You would say, I don't want to have as much money as Elon Musk. I mean, I wouldn't turn it down, but that's not my goal. I want to be like Solomon who said, don't give me too little, but don't give me too much. I'd like just enough money not to have to worry about it all the time. Visualize what your recovery from this problem would look like. What are you trying to solve? Thirdly, identify the barriers, identification of the barriers. Maybe you're thinking about a career move and you'd say, you know, I'd like to be an accountant. I think I'd really like to be an accountant. The problem is you don't know much about being an accountant. You don't know anybody who's an accountant. And from what you understand, you don't have the educational qualifications to be an accountant. What are the barriers? And that leads to a specification of action steps. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do to solve those barriers. I need to Google some articles about different kinds of accounting. I need to eat lunch with somebody in my church I may know who is an accountant. List the steps of action you need to take and your action steps become your daily to-do list. Now, with your second act script in hand, all you need to do is wait on God's go signal for your new beginning. How do you know when intermission is finally over and you're ready to start your new beginning? Have you ever seen the movie Mary Poppins? I'm on my 300th viewing of Mary Poppins with the triplets, I think. I know every word of that movie. But you might remember, if it's been a while, at the beginning, there's a weather vane that switches direction. And that indicates that Mary Poppins is about to appear. And so she stays with the children, does all these things. And then at the end of the movie, the weather vane switches in another direction, signaling it's time for Mary Poppins to leave until she returns in the sequel. And so... There's a weather, I often thought, wouldn't it be nice if we had internal weather vanes that told us, signaled when a change was coming? Well, actually, the Bible does give us some weather vanes we can look at to see if we're ready for our new beginning. Look for changes, first of all, in your attitude about your failure. Have you quit blaming other people and accepted responsibility yourself? That's a prerequisite for a new beginning. Maybe there's a change in your emotions. Are you starting to feel refreshed again and no longer physically and emotionally drained? And then finally, look for a change in your circumstances. Many times, God will signal that a change is coming by a dramatic change in your circumstances. That's what he did with Moses. The children of Israel had been 400 years in slavery in Egypt, and God said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and tell him to let the people go. And Pharaoh said, 
nine times. I will not let them go. I will not let them go. And after that 10th plague, remember what happened? He said, please go. Please go. Get out of here. Scram. I'm tired of this. Now, what did Moses do? He had a second act script ready to go. He doesn't have to say, gee, I wonder where I'd like to be living 10 years from now. He knew where he was supposed to go, to the promised land. And he had the map for how to get to the promised land and take the children of Israel there. But there was one remaining barrier between his painful past in Egypt and his promised future in the promised land. You know what that barrier was? The Red Sea. The Red Sea. As soon as they started heading out of Egypt, they ran into the Red Sea. And Pharaoh had a change of heart and sent his soldiers charging after the Israelites. And the Israelites had a choice. They could do a U-turn and be slaughtered by the Egyptian soldiers, or they could go forward and drown. What a choice. And then God did something miraculous. You know the rest of the story. God miraculously parted the Red Sea, and he took a strip of land and made it dry for the Israelites to pass from one side to the other side. You know, I've often thought about that story about the biggest hero in that entire story, the greatest model of faith. It wasn't Moses. Remember, Moses stood on the side with his arms up in his best Charlton Heston pose, Hey, that's all he did. No, to me, the bravest person in that entire group was that first unnamed Israelite in line who took the first step on that land, knowing that as he walked through those pillars of water, they could come crashing down on him at any moment. What gave him the faith to go forward? When God said, go forward, yeah, he noticed the obstacle. But he believed that the same God who had miraculously delivered him from Pharaoh's oppressive grip, that same God would see him safely to the other side. And ladies and gentlemen, he'll do the same for you. Have you acknowledged your mistake and taken responsibility for it? Have you experienced God's forgiveness in your life? Have you focused, had time to focus on the cause of your mistake and what God's future for you might look like? If you've done those things, don't be surprised at some changes, dramatic changes that come into your life. Maybe a dinner invitation to somebody from somebody you're interested in having a relationship with. It might be a call from a headhunter. But don't be surprised when those winds begin to blow in a different direction. It's God signaling that your new beginning is about to begin. And remember, you can go forward in that plan, knowing that the same God who has miraculously preserved you and delivered you to this point will see you safely to the other side. That's worth applauding for. That's worth applauding for. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. For some of you, that new beginning starts with admitting your mistake and experiencing God's forgiveness. Are you ready to experience that forgiveness? You can't pay for your sin yourself. You can't cover it over. Just admit it and believe that Christ has paid that debt for you. Today, if you would like to receive God's forgiveness in your life, I invite you to pray this prayer in your heart as I pray it out loud, knowing that God is listening to you. Would you pray this with me? Dear God, thank you for loving me. I know I have failed you in so many ways, and I'm truly sorry for the sins in my life. But I believe what I've heard today, that you love me so much, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for me to take the punishment I deserve to take. And right now, I'm trusting in what Jesus did for me, not in my good works, but in what Jesus did for me to save me from my sins. Thank you for forgiving me and help me to live the rest of my life for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
For those of you watching online, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, I encourage you to go to the top of the screen, click on the link that says, I prayed the prayer to trust in Christ. As soon as you do that, I'll be notified today of your decision. And I want to send you some free material about what it means to live your life as a Christian.